morning, everyone. I am Kira Epstein, the New School Coordinator, and we're here today with Steve Heilig, New School Host Extraordinaire, to welcome drug policy reformer Ethan Nadelman to the New School. We're recording this conversation. We'll have produced audio and video files available on our website. You can find all of our recordings also on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Ken Adams is behind the scenes helping us with production. Thank you, Ken. And finally, wanted to thank you for your donations to the new school. We operate on a slim budget, and your donations allow us to make these events available to everyone, regardless of their situation. If you haven't already, you can donate on our website. Now we're ready to begin. So Steve Heilig and Ethan Nailman, welcome to the new school at Commonweal. Thank you very much, Kira and Ken. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to everybody who's listening now or later, wherever you may be. And uh, this uh, talk today is uh, something I've been looking forward to because our guest is somebody I've known and respected a long time. And it is unfortunately doubly timely at this point because uh, this last year of the pandemic has uh, really been a year of double pandemic at least. And you could add more if you want, but the problems related to uh, drug abuse, addiction, et cetera, have skyrocketed in many areas. Uh, you know, overdose, relapses, uh, associated uh, social problems, et cetera, have really uh, increased. And uh, I'm sitting here in San Francisco where it certainly is a problem as well. And one of the longtime concerns about this is how these problems are confronted. And the way that I met first uh, Ethan Nadelman was, oh, probably 20 years ago, uh, we started putting on series of forums on various drug uh, policy problems uh, in San Francisco at the San Francisco Medical Society, where I was working in health policy. And we, the idea, the reason we actually uh, agreed to do these and did these together for years, along with our colleague, Marsha Rosenbaum, who's here in San Francisco, well, and who has done a, a, a new school talk before, was that we had the basic agreement, the, these problems are much better addressed as health issues, public health issues, uh, than as criminal issues. And that entails an awful lot of, of concerns and issues. So. Ethan Nadelman was already known as one of, if not really, maybe the leading uh, voice in uh, drug policy reform um, in the United States. And as a, you may have read in our uh, little capsule biography of him for this talk, Rolling Stone magazine called him the real drug czar, which is something a lot of us wish were true <laughs> at the time. So he has done a tremendous amount of work uh, writing, speaking, and actually affecting, affecting uh, policy changes all these years. I won't go into the details too much. They are on there, but um, you can see his TED Talk, which is, of course, a short version, has been seen by two million people, um, and that's because of his stature in this field. So I really want to start off by welcoming Ethan. Thanks for joining us here from New York City. And I want to start really with about you, really. So let's uh, hear a little bit from you about how you got into this in the first place, starting you know, with, with where you're from in your childhood and your education and how you then evolved into drug policy as the focus of your, of your work. Sure, Steve. And it's good to see you on this Zoom here. I've missed you. And in fact, I think those early seminars that you and Marsha organized as co-productions of the San Francisco Medical Society and the predecessor to the Drug Policy Alliance, what was known as the Linda Smith Center, I think that actually dates back to the late 90s. Uh, so yeah, we really, really go quite back, back quite a way. Yeah, but the quick um, on me, you know, born in New York City, grew up in the suburbs in Westchester. Dad was a rabbi. Um, you know, uh, went to college when I, you know, at, at eighteen at McGill and then at Harvard, and and part of that involved starting to smoke marijuana and wondering why why I was treated or could be treated as a criminal for doing so, and then in graduate school in the early eighties. Um, really getting increasingly interested in issues of deviance, international law enforcement, and the drug issue from an intellectual perspective. And I think also realizing 
more subconsciously at first than consciously, that I needed my intellectual pursuits to be linked to something I was personally passionate about. I had previously focused on the Middle East, and that had become a little depressing, so I thought I would get into something cheery like drugs. Um, but back in the early 80s, it was kind of a backwater issue. By the time I finished my dissertation and started teaching at Princeton um, uh, in the late 80s, the drug issue had exploded. It was the number one issue in public opinion. People are old enough to remember. It was like, like McCarthyism on steroids. I mean, it was you couldn't pick up a newspaper, turn on a TV show without there being some sensationalist report about drugs. And it was the crack cocaine crisis. It was an international thing. It was a domestic thing. Marijuana was being swept in with all that. And so I published a series of articles um, in the prestigious publication science and in some policy journals, foreign policy and public interest, in which I basically argued that the war on drugs was doing more harm than good. And in fact, the war on drugs was doing more harm than even drug use and drug abuse per se. And that we needed to put all options and various forms of legalization on the table, but that ultimately the optimal drug policy would be the one that accepted that drugs are here to stay and that sought to reduce both the harms of drug misuse and the harms of failed and punitive drug prohibitionist policies, as well as poorly designed regulatory policies. And that really became my mission. Um, so some years later, in the early 90s, I got a surprising call, an uh, invite, invitation to lunch from a, a guy named George Soros, who was at that point not yet famous. He was interested in this issue. And, and we met, we talked. I talked about harm reduction. He kind of got the broader, the broader global issues. And I left Princeton in 94. Started up an organization, the Lunisma Center, started putting together ballot initiatives, including California's first uh, major medical marijuana initiative, Prop 215, which had been drafted by local activists, but where you know my input was needed to raise the money and make it into a real professional campaign and make it real, and just built that up. And then the Drug Policy Alliance uh, represented the merger of my Lindisma Center and another organization, Drug Policy Foundation, in 2000. And so I built that up over 17 years, and it became the leading organization in the world advocating for alternatives to the war on drugs, um, and, and really focusing on three main areas, Steve. One third of our work was on ending marijuana prohibition. So that meant marijuana decriminalization, taking on uh, racist marijuana arrests, uh, legalizing first for medical purposes, and then more broadly for all, all adults. The second third of our mission was about rolling back the role of the drug war in mass incarceration. So everything from getting rid of mandatory minimum drug sentences to alternatives to incarceration, um, to you know, credit, you know, taking on drug-free school zone laws, which are basically you know mandatory minimum laws with better marketing um, and things like that. Uh, and then the third piece was treating drug use and addiction as a health issue, not a criminal issue, as you mentioned. And that started off with things like promoting needle exchange programs, funding needle exchange programs, then taking on the issue of overdose prevention, uh, taking on the work that Marsha Rosenbaum was doing in her Safety First program about a harm reduction approach to drug education, educating Americans about what the Europeans were doing better than we were doing. So those were the big three, three things. And all of it by infused by an awareness of racial justice and the issues of racial inequity and racism woven into drug policy. But for me, the driving force being the combination of seeing this on the one hand as a great intellectual and political challenge, and on the other hand, perceiving this as one of the great human rights causes of our day. And then four years ago, I stopped running Drug Policy Alliance, took it easy for a while, um, started getting interested in the issue of the battle over e-cigarettes and vaping and tobacco harm reduction, which I know we'll talk about later. And then just a few weeks ago, um, in mid-July or early July, started a podcast called Psychoactive. So that's how I'm now re-engaging, keeping busy and having fun. Mm -hmm. So as part of this, you're something of a historian of drug policy as well. So why, you know, could you trace back um, why has this punitive, legal, prohibitionist approach been really the norm throughout the world and, you know, to various degrees, you know, until, until the reform has really started catching on? Where does it come from? Is it purely moralistic? Is it economic? Is it, you know, uh, some sort of... Uh, spiritual, <laughs> you know, yeah. position to, to be people using drugs or, you know, what do you think? 
Yes. Yeah, I mean, I certainly would say that, you know, if you want to boil it all down to understanding why we've had such a backward, costly, counterproductive, ineffective and immoral drug policy, both in the U.S. and throughout much of the world, it probably boils down to a combination of ignorance, fear, prejudice and profit. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, and I think that's true throughout the world. I think the fact that the U.S. embraced a highly punitive, moralistic approach um, explains what happens here. And I'll get into that in a moment. But I think the fact that we in the United States and successive governments from both parties saw part of their global mission as proselytizing and promoting our highly punitive, moralistic approach to drugs to the rest of the world helps explain why the rest of the world sort of kind of came along in lockstep. I mean, some of this, you know, there are some parts of the world, you know, the Arab world, the Islamic world, where, where, where alcohol or other drugs may be demonized and other places have their own big drug things. But if you look at the remarkably homogeneous set of punitive drug laws that we saw spread around the world, the role of the U.S., both bilaterally and then multilaterally through various regional and international organizations, um, you know, played a huge role. I mean, many countries landed up criminalizing marijuana or coca or cocaine, not because they had a problem. In fact, many of them didn't even know what those drugs were. It was just like the U.S. was applying pressure to sign on the bottom line, and on the dotted line, uh, whether it was an international convention or a bilateral or multilateral agreement. So that's been a huge issue. If you look historically, I mean, and if you ask the question, why are some drugs legal and other drugs illegal? What you realize is that it has relatively little to do with the relative harms and risks of these different substances and almost everything to do with who uses and who is perceived to use these substances. So if you go back to like the 1870s or whatever, when when the majority of opiate consumers were middle aged white women. I mean, this was before, you know, before you had aspirin, before you had Motrin, before you had other medications for dealing with menopause or time of the month or stuff like that. And nobody thought about criminalizing these millions of American women for using their opiate in, in, in the form of morphine or laudanum or other, you know, uh, patent medicines because nobody wanted to put their granny or auntie behind bars. But when the opiate issue began to be linked to Chinese minorities coming to this country to work on the railroads and the mines and everywhere else and kicking back in the evening by smoking a little opium the same way the good white people were kicking back by drinking a little booze. I mean, that's when you got this fear of these Chinese minorities and the fear of what would they do with their opium and their opium dens and, you know, seducing and our, our precious white women and turning them into sex slaves and all this sort of thing. And then ditto with cocaine. When it got linked, you know, cocaine was in Coca-Cola. I mean, and so far as until 1900. And so far as we know, there was no massive Coca-Cola addiction problem any more than there is a Coca-Cola addiction problem today with caffeine. But when it got linked to black people in the South snorting that white powder and potentially forgetting their quote unquote proper place in, you know, in racist you know, society, that's when you saw the fear mongering, the scary stories, not just in the South, but even the headlines in The New York Times, you know, basically demonizing black people on cocaine and resulting in in the state prohibition laws that ultimately became part of federal prohibition, even marijuana associated with Mexican migrants and Mexican-Americans in the Southwest and, and the Western states beginning in, I think, El Paso, Texas in, in 1913. And quite frankly, even if you look at alcohol prohibition, that to some extent was a broader social struggle between the white, white Americans coming from the United Kingdom and Northern and Western Europe in the late 18th, early 19th century, and the not so white, white Americans coming from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe in the late 19th, early 20th century, you know, scaring the bejesus out of people in the same way that people are freaked out about immigrant immigration from Mexico and Central America are today. So there's always been this element, right? <laughs> the major element, and not just in the US. You look at Australia, Canada, UK, anti- Chinese sentiment was prominent there. You look in Latin America and the criminalization of coca. It wasn't just about pressure by the U.S. It was about the kind of more anglicized elites looking down their noses at the coca-chewing Indios. So that's been a major thing that's played a role, especially in the U.S., but a lot of the rest of the world as well. Yeah, you know, I can I can illustrate that in a 
I mean, one of the times I was looking in the, the archives of the San Francisco Chronicle here in San Francisco, trying to find some historical information on the medical association here, which started, you know, in gold rush. So 150 years old, the earliest thing I could find in the paper was the medical society being asked in the 1890s to get a delegation together to go investigate opium dens in Chinatown asked by the mayor and the supervisors. And, you know, my first thought on that, just as you say, is that it wasn't entirely about opium. It had something to do with racial issues as well. You know, if it had been opium dens in Pacific Heights, there probably wouldn't have been this uh, this investigation. No, I think that's right. I mean, it's, it also helps explain why California and Nevada were the two first states, I believe, to have opium prohibition laws. It was really all about the Chinese minorities. Yeah. So in in uh, more recent times, as this has evolved, you mentioned the you know the eighties. That was the Reagan just say no era, et cetera. But really. Um, the Nixon years in the 60s, that was, uh, some would call that the beginning of the modern drug wars, when they actually declared war on drugs, whatever that meant. A lot of it was pot coming over from Mexico, but it was this reaction to the 60s, you know, the hippie phenomenon and everything else, right? So, yeah, I mean, you know, there is that classic quote uh, that's bandied about a lot by John Ehrlichman, the Nixon aide who's being interviewed years later about Nixon and the drug war. And he says, and nobody's quite clear whether he said it tongue in cheek or seriously. And he goes, but look at Nixon, look at the politics, right? He knew he couldn't attack blacks for being black. He knew he couldn't att attack anti-war protesters for protesting the war. But if he linked the blacks with heroin and if he linked the hippies with pot, well, that was a way after going after them for something illegal and illegitimate. Right. So Nixon does declare war on drugs. He actually tries to shut shut the Mexican border for a little while, which is something that Reagan also tried to do some years later. Um, you know, it, it, it played in the drug war has so often until very recently played into the hands of those people in the Republican Party who really wanted to promote a very reactionary political agenda. Right. And, and part of this was it plays on, first of all, it plays on fear and on two types of fear. It plays on every parent's fear around their adolescent kids and the fear that when they're going through these tough times in life or whatever, that if they're going to all of a sudden they start, are they going to start smoking weed and waking and bacon and not doing well in school or maybe getting with the wrong crowd or getting into other drugs? And that's a, a almost universal fear. And I mean, it helps explain, I think, one of the real you know, um, intellectual drivers of the drug war beginning in 1989, 90 was William Bennett. And he was one of the kind of really, really retrograde reactionary minded members of the Republican Party at a point where the Republican Party was more diverse. And he had been, I think, the former secretary of education. And he saw that here was an opportunity to play on the fears of middle American parents, many of whom voted Democrat or moderate Republicans, by getting them to freak out about their kids and drugs and embrace the most draconian policies. And then the second fear was this kind of historical fear in America, not just America, but you know we're quite distinctive about it, around race, right? And the fear that so many white people have about black people and especially about young black men, right? And so in a way, and they're also tapping into the fact that in the black community, you have a very strong anti-drug sentiment as well. Some of that comes from the kind of church-based sentiment, you know, this moralistic approach and this, you know, drugs are the devil's work. And if you look at all the opposition, the black church in much of the country to needle exchange programs or to doing the things that need to be done around HIV with gay people or drug users in the 80s and 90s. I mean, there's that, that very church-based conservatism where some of their rhetoric would almost sound like the right-wing Republicans like Jesse Helms. And the second thing was that when poor black communities, especially in the cities, when they got hit by heroin in the 60s and 70s or by crack cocaine in the 80s and early 90s, they got hit bad. You know, I mean, when some of these same drugs were hitting white populations, you know, white people are oftentimes using these drugs almost as frequently as black people were, but they weren't having as bad negative consequences generally. And to the extent they were, it was oftentimes behind closed doors. Whereas the drug trade and the drug scene and the harms of drugs were playing out in public in these communities. So you had black communities that were feeling traumatized. And when the Nixon and then Reagan said drug war, drug war, drug war, 
many parts of the black community, especially older folk and black leaders and church leaders, they embraced it. Jesse Jackson did. Right. The, the Charlie Rangel, the Harlem congressman who was a, a, heading the Congressional Select Committee on Narcotics, they were drug war. Jesse Jackson was calling himself a champion in in, uh, in in the drug war. And now they wanted not the death penalty. They didn't want to lock up a zillion people. They wanted more treatment. They wanted more investment in their communities. But when they got on board the drug war thing and didn't you know, mount any robust argument against it, what they landed up getting from Republican governments, and sometimes not much better from Democratic Congresses or presidents, was a whole lot of drug war that instigated the rush to mass incarceration at the end of the 20th century, and just a little bit of the goodies on the side for treatment in schools and investment in communities. I'll tell you, Steve, I had a fascinating, the second podcast that episode that we put up just a week ago was my conversation with James Foreman, uh, the Yale law professor who had worked as a public defender in D.C. and who had written a book a few years ago called Locking Up Our Own about the debate within the black community over the drug war and who wrote a remarkably courageous and nuanced book about that, which I would encourage our listeners uh, to check out. You know, you remind me, I, I just to, as a side note to this, I watched recently a, a film called The Summer of Soul. You may have heard about about the Harlem Cultural Festival in 1969. And I reckon this is the best movie of the year. I thought so. And now The New Yorker says so, even though the year is only half over. But anyway, at the time of this festival, which was in Harlem and all black uh, acts and everything, it's, it's just phenomenal. The moon landing happened and they go out and they ask a lot of the attendees, what do you think of this? And they all say we should be spending that on the heroin problem in the black community. You That's know. right. I, Steve, I actually did see that movie yeah. uh, just two weeks ago, me and three other people sitting in a huge theater in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> I did think it was a spectacular film. And that's true. I mean, that was the summer of 69. A heroin and other sorts of crime and other issues were a major issue. There was definitely a call for reinvent, you know, investment in the community. Sadly, you know, many of the most important ideas and innovations that might have worked better. You know, I mean, methadone was then available. And uh, uh, they were trying to make that much more available. There was a lot of resistance in the black community. Many people who saw it as the white man's chemical bracelet. So there was that problem. There was a lot. Uh, there was not a lot of embracing the European sorts of ideas. And there was basically just not the right approach to dealing with a with a, with a devastating issue at the time. And that, in retrospect, both informed what subsequently happened with crack cocaine for an older generation of people. Um, and also, to some extent, pale beside what happened with crack cocaine. Because one thing you did not see with the whole heroin epidemic was you saw more arrests and more policing, but you didn't see that massive rush to mass incarceration back in the 60s. You saw a slow increase. Um, but it was a period in American history where our incarceration rates were still roughly at the international average. You know, we, we, we don't have a historic, we, we don't have a long history of this mass incarceration. We were roughly average 50 years ago. And then we became uh, quite exceptional in the, in the decades that followed. Well, yeah, I want to say more of that when you mentioned the incarceration. I, um, I've come to reluctantly believe, going back to our first uh, question about what's driving uh, the prohibitionist policies and all that, is that a big part of it, because of the lobbyists I've seen and everything, is Profits, as you ended up saying, too, if you want to call it that. But the the investment in incarceration and the mass prison building that's gone on depends on these bodies coming through that system. So anytime you propose something, at least in California, in my experience, even lessening marijuana laws, you get the prison lobby coming at you very hard. And they're very powerful here saying, no, we can't do that. And I don't think it's because they're afraid of or don't like pot. It's they want to keep the, you know, the, the bodies yeah. in flowing through in this industry. Well, I'll tell you, see, let, me, let me partially agree and partially disagree with you on that, which is, on the one hand, there's no question that there's these for-profit interests. I mean, there are, I remember there was seeing the um, annual report of one of the big, there were two major, or there are two major prison, private prison corporations out there. And one of them, when they have to report to shareholders about potential risk to their future profits, I think the lead item was the growth of the drug policy and criminal justice reform movement. So they were very conscious that 
our growing success in reversing public opinion and public laws that had driven mass incarceration did represent a challenge to them. And I think, it, you know, it, in fact, it has resulted in some pulling back. And it's also why they're quickly shifting their view, I think, to how can we maximize the number of people um, getting arrested now and held in private prisons on, on, uh, on immigration, uh, immigration law violations. The second piece I point out to people, because a lot of people you know, who lean left in their politics, they love to beat up on big corporations, right? And they every, there's a great reason to beat up on the private prison corporations. And it isn't tough. I mean, if in fact private prisons were better than public prisons at keeping people safe and providing services, then it would be an interesting debate, but they're not even better at that. So there, there's actually no, the moral argument against, against private prisons has always been there, but then it turns out the policy argument is also there. But, you know, Steve, what you may remember is that when we were, you know, fighting uh, in California, and I found the same thing in New York and other states, our biggest opponent in the Western and Northern states was not the private prison corporations. It was the prison guards unions, right? And so we launched our first major alternatives to incarceration ballot initiative. You know, we'd done medical marijuana in 96. In 2000, we came back with the first Prop 36, which was treatment instead of incarceration, and which would, you know, if it won, which it did, doubled state funding for drug treatment by $120 million a year for five years, and we kept it going thereafter. And it basically prohibited people from being, people who've been picked up for drug possession, right, could not be locked up on their first two drug possession offenses if they did not have an extensive criminal record. Right. And our opponents were the Drug Court Judges Association and the Prison Guards Association. And, and when we won, you know, when we won that, that was the biggest criminal justice reform in America since the repeal of alcohol prohibition. But we had a fight against the Prison Guards Union. And then in 2008, you know, we drafted up another ballot initiative. I think it was Prop 5. Uh, that initially had huge public support, it would have been an overhaul of the entire California criminal justice system. It would have introduced harm reduction principles into the management of the prisons. It would have saved Californians a billion dollars a year, I think. It would have reduced the prison population by 25,000 nonviolent drug offenders over the following years. I mean, it was a win, 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 win. But what we got was the prison union and, unfortunately, Jerry Brown, who was absolutely dreadful back then on this issue, and the political establishment all coming in, flying against us, and the ballot initiative, you know, lost badly. So those private, the, the prison guards unions have been as, because for them, it's about jobs and not just jobs, right. but overtime. You know, I mean, I was happy to see in recent years, they stopped opposing the marijuana stuff, I think, for two reasons. One was that there aren't that many people in state prison on marijuana offenses. They're either in local jails or in federal prison. The second reason is that I think what do a lot of those prison guards want to do when they get home from work? You know, I mean, you're living in the middle of nowhere. You want to go home and light up a joint. You don't want to get drug tested and lose your job. So I was happy to see them stay out of that. The bigger issue, though, is I think we have to realize that in the end, the profit side of the drug war has not been the overwhelming driving factor. I think that moralistic dimension, the fear dimension, the punitive dimension, um, I mean, all of that stuff has loomed actually much larger in a way. Um, uh, uh, and I think even now we see the move towards legalization. People say, oh, it's because we can get, get tax revenue or whatever. But once again, we know from our research that that's a piece of it. But it's not definitely not what moved public opinion in favor of legalization. There's other things that are going on that are bigger. And I'll sometimes point out, if you look at the various players in the criminal justice system, you know, the cops have been against drug reform, the prison guards and the prison folks, the judges. But the worst of all the components of the criminal justice system in opposing drug policy and criminal justice reform has been until recently the prosecutors. And for the prosecutors, it's not about money because, you know, what, they don't really care. It's not job. You know, it's about power. It's about interpersonal power vis-a-vis -vis the people they're going after. It's about, you know, the, the strategic power in terms of being able to coerce people to confess or make a deal about making life easier for them. And, you know, until this rise of the new prosecu reform prosecutors movement in recent years, you have one of them in San Francisco. We have one of them in Brooklyn. Um, I just interviewed Larry Krasner, the Philadelphia DA, for my podcast uh, a few weeks ago. I mean, you know, that the prosecutors are the ones who are not just opposing sentencing reform, 
They were the ones opposing needle exchange programs. They were the ones opposing 911 Good Samaritan laws to reduce overdoses or making naloxone available until recently. So, you know, that's an element that's not about profit. It's about power and other venal things in our society and culture. Um, one of the things I do here still is uh, teach a bit in the medical school here at UC San Francisco. And we lead a tour of freshman medical students, very young, right out of college. Brilliant. They're at UCSF, which is one of the top schools in the country. And a lot of it is done, you know, in con conjunction with the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, my, you know, one of my mentors here, Dr. Dave Smith. And I asked them a question now, while we're walking around the Haight, we're seeing bodies in the street and we're seeing the old murals of Jimi Hendrix and all that and stuff as well. And I asked them, what do you think the three most lethal substances drugs are in America? And it really gets kind of interesting, but they're usually talking about heroin, cocaine. And I have to point out to them that they are tobacco, alcohol, and prescription drugs in terms of numbers. And then I said, what do these have in common? And that's another discussion. I said, well, these are the legal ones, right? So it points to the issue of the arbitrariness that you mentioned of what is prohibited. Um, so cannabis doesn't even, you know, register in that, in the harms thing, but that has been the public one, you know, uh, the public yeah, in a yeah. lot of places. So I, I wonder, you know, this this arbitrariness and these different substances, when you talk about harm reduction and uh, legalization, you know, and that, those kind of things, do you specifically focus on certain ones? Are you talking about legalizing and doing harm reduction for everything? Or, you know, are you, you really more specific on the substances themselves? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Steve, I mean, when I was running Drug Policy Alliance, it was overwhelmingly focused on the illicit drugs because we were trying to both reduce the harms of drugs, which many people were, but also the harms of prohibitionist policies, which in the early years, almost nobody was focused on doing. And fortunately, a very substantial movement, a criminal justice reform movement, has grown up in, in a massive way in the last five or, five or 10 years. Um, but let's just take two substances which really complicate the issue, right? The first one is opioids. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, there, you know, well, there's always been this problem with heroin um, and some of the other opioids, you know, for, for many years, you know, there's been heroin problems. And when Federal Bureau of Narcotics Act created in 1930, initially Harry Anslinger, the founder of it, wasn't even interested in marijuana, right? He was all about, about heroin, the little heroin trade and heroin coming from Mexico. Um, and as we discussed before, it became a major issue in the 60s and into the 70s. But, you know, if you fast forward and you look at the overdose crisis, um, um, and it really is serious now, right? I mean, that thing, you know, really gets going beginning in the late 90s, early 2000s with the overpromotion of oxycodone and specifically the formulation produced by Purdue Pharma called OxyContin. They create this drug for managing severe pain among people post-cancer, you know, um, terminally ill, which is really a miracle drug for hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of drugs. It's a slow release pain thing that's really improving the quality of life for huge numbers of people. But what those guys then do is they grossly overpromote it to people dealing with all sorts of chronic pain, some of whom are going to benefit from it, but many of whom are not. And they're pitching it to doctors. They're at, I mean, they're just doing all sorts of stuff. And that's when you begin to see this growing problem involving pharmaceutical opioids, both because of the over, over, over um, prescribing by doctors, either doctors who are naive or corrupt or whatever, as well as by the diversion of these drugs into the illicit market. Then, and, you know, paradoxically, what happens is that gets replaced by, um, to some extent, by heroin, right? And heroin has been coming from Mexico and somewhat from Colombia. You know, we're one of the few countries which doesn't get most of our heroin from Afghanistan in the world. And, and heroin, in fact, there was a recent report out by the RAND Corporation showing that as Purdue Pharma changed the formulation of its prescription drugs, so you couldn't crush it anymore, Right. And as all the doctors begin to get cracked down on or get scared to prescribe, you see actually the number of overdose fatalities increases because people are switching over to heroin, which is not necessarily more dangerous, but it's even more unregulated. It's even harder to know what you're getting, what you're using and all this sort of stuff. Right. And then, you know, it's not very possible to crack. It's not all that easy to crack down on heroin because it's coming out of Mexico, which has got a huge landlord and sea border. See, I mean, you really can't stop it coming out of Mexico. We've been getting our heroin from Mexico for almost a century. 
Uh, it hasn't always been the number one source, but it's been big. And then emerges fentanyl. Well, fentanyl, we think about as a pharmaceutical drug, right? It's a very powerful opioid. It's, you know, 30, 40, 50 times more potent per gram than heroin is. But it's routinely given in the hospital. You know, I remember my daughter having surgery. And when she came out of surgery, they, she had it for a day or two in a kind of drip or it's given in the form of a patch, a very, very effective pain medication. But the fentanyl that people are using is not pharmaceutically produced fentanyl that's being diverted to the black market. It's stuff being produced out of China and then shipped here either via direct or via Canada or Mexico. So it's being produced in China either legally, illegally, quasi-legally, shipped here illegally. And so it's a kind of pharmaceutical sort of drug. So it points out to you the ambiguity of all of the um, of how the opioid stuff um, of how we think about it, right now the final piece on this is you know CDC Center for Disease Control came out with its report uh, a couple of weeks ago in in mid July, and they reported that last year ninety three thousand probably more almost one hundred thousand Americans died of what they called an overdose. Overdose went up, overdose fatalities, remember most overdoses are not fatal, so I'm specifically saying overdose fatalities. Overdose fatalities went up 30% from the year before, in part because of COVID and in part for other reasons. It went up in 48 of the 50 states around the country. Fentanyl was the major driving thing, but heroin is still there, pharmaceuticals are there. And then you're seeing methamphetamine and cocaine show up more, both by themselves and mixed with fentanyl, as well as other types of weird, you know, synthetic drugs that are getting out there. So it's becoming a massive, massive issue. And, and I'll tell you, um, I was just in your town in San Francisco earlier this week, and I happened to go over to um, hear your mayor, London Bringett, speak at this political non, uh, this nonprofit restaurant, political lounge called Manny's. And she gave a nice talk. And at the end of it, I stood up and I said, you know, you know, mayor, uh, you know, what San Francisco has done on COVID is absolutely incredible. You're one of the best cities in the country. But the exact opposite is true on the overdose issue. I say, San, you know, around the country, there were four times as many COVID deaths as there were overdose deaths last year. In San Francisco, there were like two and a half to three times as many overdose deaths as there were COVID deaths, right? San Francisco's overdose rate is triple the overdose rate in New York or Los Angeles. San Francisco's overdose fatality rate is higher than West Virginia, Right. I mean, you're talking about a number of people dying that is now equally or surpassing the number of people dying of AIDS in San Francisco in the late 1980s. You're talking about a massive public health crisis that in terms of mortality grossly exceeds the covid crisis in San Francisco. It doesn't, although it doesn't have the broader impact on on everybody's you know life and on business and all this sort of stuff. And one thing I said to her is I said, look, you're doing a lot of the right stuff on treatment and harm reduction and, and needle exchange and, uh, uh, you know, naloxone and uh, trying to make drug testing strips available, all the things that a, a, a good program trying to deal with that is. But I said, you know, and I appreciate the fact that you're trying to get behind safe injection sites. And by the way, the state of Rhode Island just legalized, you know, voted to legalize them. So hopefully that will encourage both the Biden administration and San Francisco to be bolder. But I said, you know, what you need to look at now is what they're doing in Vancouver. Vancouver's got, you know, demographics very much like San Francisco, except it's bigger, right? Big, very wealthy city, a very substantial Asian immigrant, you know, kind of minority population, or maybe a majority population, a very big homeless population that's, dr that's drawn there because of the qualities of the city. Um, but what they're now doing is something called safe supply. And safe supply is about saying to people who are using street drugs, Look, we want you to quit. We're going to offer you treatment, offer you blah, 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 blah. But quite frankly, if you're not ready to quit and you're not willing to go into methanol buprenorphine, we would prefer that you get the drugs you want from a legally regulated source instead of from the street. So they're now doing things like making, you know, pharmaceutical heroin or pharmaceutical hydromorphone, which is indistinguishable from heroin, or, or I think even fentanyl pills. And even I think dexedrine pills. They're basically saying, come to us, the government, 
will provide it just so you're not getting this, you know, crappy stuff and more dangerous, unregulated stuff on the streets. So the question about the legal, the illegal, it's all kind of fluid. The most important thing is to understand the limitations of a model that focuses on reducing supply and on law enforcement and understand that how much not just education, but trying to get people using illegal drugs to have an opportunity to get what they want or need from a legal source um, is really going to be an important part of this solution. So we're talking about harm reduction. How would you define that since it's such a central part of, of drug policy? Well, I mean, I, you know, basically I give people typically four definitions of harm reduction. The, for the original one, which is conceived out of, you know, you know, Liverpool, Merseyside region of England and the Netherlands in the early 80s, which is clean needles. I mean, they figured out early on that people were spreading the virus, not because of the drugs or even because of needles. It was sharing needles that had already been, you know, gotten, you know, HIV on them. And so it was the basic idea of needle exchange kind of instigates the language and thinking of harm reduction. You had harm reduction thinking back in the 70s in the Jimmy Carter days, but they didn't use that phrase, right? And then I think the second definition is the one which says it's not just about clean needles. It's really any activity um, um, where we can reduce the harms. I mean, it's things like, you know, you know, using motorcycle helmets or bicycle helmets to reduce those sorts of accidents or football helmets. It's things like uh, designated driving norms and seatbelts to reduce the accidents on the road or, or creating safer roads and better lighting and safer cars that don't have metal inside. Um, it, it, it's making the lock zone available, even methadone. If you do it in a in a kind of more open minded way is harm reduction. Buprenorphine is harm reduction. Heroin prescribing anything that seeks to reduce the negative use of a drug or an activity among people who don't want to abstain or aren't ready to abstain, um, but who can consume or do this thing in a less dangerous form. And it's important to understand that harm reduction is not the antithesis of abstinence. It's the antithesis of abstinence only. It's the antithesis, antithesis of an abstinence-only ideology. Many harm reduction leaders, the movement leaders, have been themselves personally abstinent, right? Many people recommend abstinence as an ultimate objective. But it's saying today, if you're unable or willing to stop, there are safer ways and safer forms in which to consume these drugs. The third definition, as I said at the beginning, is the policy definition, that drug policy should aim to reduce both the harms of drugs and the harm to prohibitionist policies. And the fourth definition is really the moral one, which is really part A says, it's not about demanding that you be abstinent before I can help you. It's about accepting that I have to meet you, the drug user, the drug consumer, where you are in order to help you take the steps that you feel able and desiring of taking in order to lead a less dangerous, less risky, healthy, better life, whether your ultimate objective is abstinence or just finding a way to normalize your drug use so it's no longer undermining your life. And part B is basically the core principle of drug policy reform, which is the one that says that nobody deserves to be punished or discriminated against or amongst based simply upon what we put in our body. That there is no legitimate basis in science, medicine, or for that matter, ethics, or even the Bible to say to some parent who, God forbid, has one kid who's an alcoholic and the other one kid's a heroin addict, we're going to treat your first kid one way where they don't get in trouble unless they get behind the wheel of a car or beat somebody up. We're going to treat your other kid another way where all they have to do is be caught in possession or even test positive for having the drug in their system, even if they're not hurting another soul. There's no moral basis for that. So that's my, you know, my, my four part definition of harm reduction, which I think covers the basis. Yeah. You know, even here in California, we supported as, as a medical profession, uh, decriminalization, legalization of cannabis, you know, not because we thought people should be smoking more of it or that we thought it was harmful, any of that. It was just that clearly putting people into the prison system, et cetera, for pot was more harmful than anything they were doing by smoking it. Mm -hmm. you know, the primary, I think, so it was a harm reduction approach. Mm -hmm. um, um, countries, I'm wondering. So the, big, the biggest policy issue in the broadest sense is legalization slash decriminalization um, what's the model that you favor this? A lot of people talk about Portugal nowadays. 
um, but there's other ideas out there. What's what's your kind of policy prescription if you have? Well, to- I mean, it really depends upon the drug as well, right? I think with marijuana, there's all these different models appearing in the United States and different states and localities as well now as in Canada and Uruguay, hopefully Mexico, which is, <laughs> they keep tripping over themselves. They keep legalizing it, but not quite legalizing it. Um, I would say that basically, if I'm looking for a model um, on on legalization of marijuana, I would at this point appoint to New York. And I'm very proud to say that my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, and especially my successors, um, Cassandra Frederic, who is now my successor as head of Drug Policy Alliance, and her former deputy, uh, Melissa Moore, um, who just uh, who, who ran the New York campaign uh, once Cassandra became the head of the national organization. In fact, I just interviewed Melissa. It just went up on my podcast, Psychoactive, uh, yesterday about how New York legalized. But I think New York really stands now as the real new gold standard. I mean, in terms of properly regulating the industry, trying to figure out the right tax rates, uh, trying to give a leg up to smaller businesses, try to integrate the, 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 the social and racial equity provisions. And not just for, you know, uh, you know, I mean, especially black and brown people who have been so harmed by the war on marijuana, the war on drugs, but even for like, you know, ex- for veterans and things like that. You know, New York State's the first state to say that you can smoke a, a joint anywhere you can smoke a cigarette, like still on the streets and the sidewalks and what have you. Um, you know, and so I think New York, both because it had the benefit of learning from other states first, secondly, because um, the Senate had gone all Democrat in recent years and because Governor Cuomo, who has been kind of formally supportive, but actually been getting in the way of the optimal legislation because he was so weakened by the scandals he's gotten himself into around COVID and Me Too, that he was in no position to block the reforms. And thirdly, because Drug Policy Alliance, with a bunch of others, created these remarkable coalitions. I mean, all fantastic coalitions um, across the board. Um, so we're able to overcome the opposition from upstate, from conservative voters, from law enforcement groups, from the anti-marijuana groups. So I really encourage people to keep their eye on New York in terms of how to do marijuana right um, until it's hopefully one day uh, sur- superseded by another model. On psychedelics? I'm curious to see how it evolves. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it looks like with the study, psilocybin and MDMA are going to be getting approved by the FDA in coming years, and that will be in a fairly controlled environment involving prescribed substances. We're going to have to find new ways of thinking about um, prescription of these substances. I don't think we're going to see any movement towards an uh, over-the-counter market like marijuana, maybe with microdosing. If they do it in a way that's not easily turned into macrodosing, uh, I think the decrim nature. Uh, initiatives where they decriminalize possession and encourage the uh, therapeutic approach. I think those are, generally speaking, a positive model. When it comes to the other drugs, you know, I mean, Portugal provides a model of a country which 20 years ago passed legislation saying, look, we are not going to lock up anybody for simple possession of drugs, no matter how many times we catch them. If they're really a bad guy, we'll catch them for something else. But when, if somebody's using drugs and they don't have a problem, we're going to give them a little tongue lashing and say, don't get caught again. And if they have a real problem, we're just going to keep encouraging them to get help. And we're going to be innovative and pushy about it, but we're not going to be coercive about it. We're not going to give people the choice between jail or treatment. And that Portugal approach has worked out remarkably well. Now, what the Portuguese did not do is what you've seen happen in Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, and some other countries which are things like safe injection sites, which have now been, you know, I think, wisely relabeled overdose prevention sites, and which hopefully, I think San Francisco's got a kind of illegal, semi-legal one now, and some other cities do, but hopefully they'll be fully legal soon. But these exist in 60 or 70, 80 cities around the world right now, um, like a needle exchange program with a back room with a nurse where people can safely inject, but still buy their drugs on the black market. Um, But the other important stuff they're doing is allowing people to go to um, heroin clinics, where people who have tried methadone buprenorphine did not work, and they can go to a clinic and get pharmaceutical heroin, and they can inject or smoke it there. They can't take it home. They can go up to three times a day. It's either free or maybe costs a few, you know, you know, gilder or or pounds or marks or whatever it might be. Um, but I'm really looking now at Vancouver, notwithstanding its troubles, as being something of a model because they're doing all these things now. They have legal marijuana. 
I think they're trying to do it in a thoughtful way. They have the heroin maintenance and hydromorphone programs. They have safe injection. And now I think they're providing some of the kind of, you know, path-breaking leadership with their with the safe supply model that we talked about just before, you know? So, Steve, we got time to get into the last of the issues that you and yes, I have. Yes, we will. We'll get there. So I was going to say, I was glad. I was going to ask you about two more. One was psychedelics. I mean, this is a fascinating evolution of, of you know, coming full circle from the 60s and Timothy Leary and all that. And then now this is coming up with, um, you know, all, major universities all around the country establishing research sites for this. For various things, including, ironically enough, addiction is one of the primary indications for some of the psychedelic research, but certainly right. PTSD and depression and other things, too. And Michael Pollan, who we mentioned, his book was number one for a while there about this topic. So that's really fascinating to see. You live long enough, you see these things, you know, start to happen. Um, the other one you'd be interested to hear, you know, two years ago, the American Society of Addiction Medicine's annual meeting was here in San Francisco. And Coincidentally or otherwise, the hotel they were at right across the street at Glide Church, which is in the Tenderloin, where a lot of the uh, biggest street problems are, there was a model self and in safe injection site set up. And uh, we took large groups of these of the, the addiction medicine docs over for a little tour of this. And, you know, the addiction medicine as a specialty is focused on recovery, uh, abstinence, et cetera, and not enabling but I'd say it was universal. Once they went through, they all came out saying, this is a great thing. We really got to try this. So now we even have the AMA saying these need to be tried, you know, so we are help, hopeful about getting this. this yeah. Well, you know, I'll tell you also, you know, I mean, I know I keep mentioning the podcast, but it's, it's what I'm excited about these days. Yeah. I had two people I interviewed that neither of them have gone up. They had, they'll be available later on this summer. One was a professor at Columbia now named Elias Dakwar, who has done a trial involving combining ketamine and mindfulness meditation in treating addiction. And it's one of the very rare studies being funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, uh, but, you know, finding positive results. And I think we'll see that happening with some of the other substances as well. The other thing I want to mention was one of my other guests, and it was the one person who I was most surprised except in my invitation, was Nora Volkow who has been the head of National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, for the last 18 years. And I've been very critical of her and her agency. She very graciously accepted my invitation. But I grilled her. And one of the many questions I grilled her on, I mean, I was very critical of her about the lack of, 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 of robust funding for ethnographic work to really give a, get a better grip on the overdose issue. Um, but the other one is, why aren't you funding more research involving involving uh, psychedelics and addiction treatment? I mean, they're doing a little bit with ketamine, but I don't think they're doing anything with LSD or psilocybin or mescaline or anything like that. And she didn't have a good answer. And, you know, I pointed out to her that other elements of NIH now, you know, the ones that deal with cancer and the ones that look at more alternative, you know, treatments, they are beginning. The head of NIH, Francis Collins, just said some positive things about the psychedelics research. So I'm hoping the government will get will get more behind that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we are seeing some movement in the right direction on that stuff. It's, it's uh, And I have to put in a plug. I mean, Rick, Rick Doblin and his organization, MAPS. Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies has just done heroic work for, I mean, Rick's been involved in this longer than I've been. Rick, Rick started his organization in 86, I think. I didn't start speaking out till 87 and didn't start my organization until 94. So he's, I think, a guy who's going to go down in history for his work in this area. Yeah, we had him and a whole panel of people on psychedelics at our last addiction conference here in San Francisco. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I mentioned tobacco before, and that remains, you know, the most lethal in terms of numbers in, in our country. And one of the issues that's come up in the last few years has been vaping of various substances, but including, uh, you know, tobacco-related products. And you have now delved in this quite a bit. You and I have argued about it somewhat. So give us your pitch on it and how you see this. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I, I was intrigued as I was running Drug Policy Alliance. I was intrigued by the issues around tobacco harm reduction, but we were so focused on the illegal drugs that we would generally only get into it if it became an issue of like racial discrimination, where people in public housing projects were being prohibited from smoking or vaping, whereas anybody who didn't live in public housing, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you, um, I, I right after I stopped running BPA four years ago, I went to a conference on tobacco harm reduction that was organized by Jerry Stimson. And Jerry Stimson had been one of the leaders in international harm reduction with illicit drugs out of the United Kingdom. 
And I was struck by the fact that many of the people I most respected, Alex Wodak, the kind of guru of harm reduction and drug policy from Australia, Pat O'Hare, who founded the International Harm Reduction Association, Jerry Stimson, who was his successor, uh, Mark Tyndall in, in Vancouver. These were all people who had established their bona fides in the illicit drug harm reduction area and were now seeing tobacco harm reduction as very much from the same frame. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized they were right. And what started drawing in was that for the same reason that I got drawn into the drug policy reform debate in the in the mid late 80s, which is the more you looked at the evidence, you more you saw that it took you one way towards a certain type of public health strategy and all this. But the public opinion and mainstream media and the political leadership were all going the other way. And it was that huge disparity between what where the world was going and where the evidence was going that drew me in. Right. And part of the what made it challenging was to bring this closer together. Well, I see the same thing going on now in this fight over vaping and e-cigarettes and tobacco harm reduction, where the more you immerse yourself in the literature, the more you realize that the emergence of e-cigarettes and vaping and also the oral tobacco, the snus and these other sorts of things like that represents a major advance. I mean, a technological breakthrough that is entirely consistent with harm reduction. Right. And what's holding it back, of course, I think is two things. One is that people are freaked out, especially in elite liberal cities like San Francisco, about their kids beginning to jewel and to vape. And, oh, my God, they're getting addicted to this vaping sort of stuff. And who knows what will happen next, right? And that's one issue. And the second issue is that although e-cigarettes and vaping were driven not by big tobacco, they were actually driven by people opposed to big tobacco, you know, basically, you know, small manufacturers coming up with alternatives to smoking. And then eventually big tobacco realized they better jump into this in order to make sure they didn't get left behind there are now increasingly dominating it. But what's clear to me is the evidence overwhelmingly shows that what's going on now in San Francisco and, any, and many other cities in terms of banning e-cigarettes, banning, banning other tobacco harm reduction products, banning all of these flavors, not just the child, I mean, calling a, you know, e-cigarette flavor, you know, tutti frutti or some kind of child friendly flavor, you can get rid of that. But the flavors that all of that sort of stuff and the demonization and the miseducation you know, which is being, I mean, driven in a massive way by Michael Bloomberg. I mean, Michael Bloomberg, who played a heroic role in opposing big tobacco on, and opposing smoking, is now undoing a huge amount of the good he did by having this ban vaping campaign. And so I think that these campaigns to ban the e-cigarettes and the vaping and other alternatives to cigarettes is going to land up being a a major step backward in terms of public health, because quite simply, the benefits to adult smokers who can't quit of switching to e-cigarettes or snus or things like that or other vaping devices is monumental in terms of years of life saved. Whereas the risk to young people who start vaping the vast majority of whom are never going to go to cigarettes unless they were already inclined to go that way in the first place is almost certainly going to be de minimis. I think 20 years from now, we'll be looking at the vaping thing among teens as having been relatively a non-issue from a public health perspective. But we'll look at the fact that 500,000 Americans continue to die prematurely from smoking and that switching to e-cigarettes and vaping now appears to be the single most effective way to quit smoking. And for some way, people, it's a, it's a transition thing from smoking to vaping to abstinence. Right. And so I look at the reports coming out. Look, National Academy of Science Institute of Medicine is very clear that vaping is dramatically safer than smoking. Right. Even the CDC acknowledges this. The famous Cochrane reports, which do their meta analyses, they are consistent in saying this. You look at Ken Warner, perhaps the leading tobacco control economist, the former dean of the University of Michigan School of Public Health. You know, he's saying this. You look at Steve Schroeder, who ran the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, has been running the anti-smoking unit at UCSF for many years. He's saying this. I mean, you're talking about monumental evidence that says we need to get behind vaping and e-cigarettes, try to keep kids from doing it, but understand that the non-tobacco flavored e-cigarettes are important for adults in terms of their quitting cigarettes and staying quit. And meanwhile, the evidence about the kids show that while they like the flavors, the reasons why they get into this stuff 
by and large, are not about the flavors, and that most of the kids who have been vaping are A, not becoming regular vapors, and many of those are still quitting, and virtually none of them have basically continued on to cigarette smoking. The ones who do are oftentimes the more risk-inclined kids to begin with, right? So, I mean, you know, I think that we need to keep this stuff in perspective, and it's galling to me to see so many of my political allies, you know, liberal progressive Democrats in California, New York, and Congress, who are my allies on medical marijuana, marijuana decrim, marijuana legalization, harm reduction, needle exchange, overdose prevention, you know, all drug decrim, now flipping the other way and abandoning their core harm reduction principles because of the freak out around kids. And you and I both remember for many years, the war on drugs was essentially justified as one great big child protection act. Why couldn't we legalize medical marijuana? People say it's about the kids. Why can't we have needle exchange? About the kids. Why can't we reduce incarceration or decriminalize drug possession? About the kids. And it was bullshit in every case. And quite frankly, since vaping emerged, we saw a more dramatic drop in adolescent smoking than had ever happened before, which is almost impossible to explain, except by virtue of the fact that some of the kids who would have been smoking have switched to vaping. So is vaping among adolescents a concern? Yes. Are there things we might be able to do it? Yes. Do I think it's going to be something of a fad? Probably yes. But the harms of nicotine to the human body and even to the adolescent are negligible compared to the harms of sustained smoking among older people. And I think we need to uh, embrace this harm reduction approach. And I realize that for much of your San Francisco audience, you know, this sounds like heresy, but hey, quite frankly, what drew me to drug policy reform in the late 80s, early 90s, was I like engaging in heresy when that heresy is grounded in the science and the public evidence and compassion and human rights. And that's the same thing driving me today. So thanks for asking. <laughs> No, that's what I liked about you, too. Uh, no, I don't think there's any debate. I agree with you. I mean, I don't think there's any debate about the you, better vaping than smoking and that it works for a lot of smokers trying to quit this. I, I still am skeptical about some of, you know, what what is going to be the balance of harms versus benefits. And I think you can have both. I think you can get vaping, et cetera, as a harm reduction to, to existing smokers and do better with keeping it uh, minimized among those who are not smokers, you know? And so I just, you know, part of this may just be my, my long-term uh, ingrained distrust, which is the mildest word I have of the tobacco industry, which is now the vaping industry too. Um, you know, we just saw, they bought an issue of a medical journal, you know, the jewel company, they bought it to publish all their, all their propaganda in there. I mean, it's just crazy stuff. And Jewel, Jewel was here and we saw what they have done too. So I just, I can't imagine myself supporting that industry. So that this is a bias, of course, and I admit it. Right? Well, Steve, Steve, I'll just say a few things. That One is that people are more into information. Probably the most brilliant guy in the world in this issue is a guy named Clyde Bates. He's got a website called Counterfactual and check that out. But also look at the writings of Ken Warner, um, or contact Steve Schroeder at, at, at UCSF. But Ken Warner, you know, he's done these huge models looking at the relative risks on these things. When it comes to the fact of big tobacco, I don't trust big tobacco as far as I can throw them, and I can't throw them anywhere, right? I mean, they have an interest. Their bottom line is, pro is profit-making. They do vary, by the way. PMI, Philip Morris, is different than some of the other ones, and some are more committed than others. But I think the key thing is that what you really need in this industry is something like a Tesla. You need a smaller, you know, innovative organization that it, which is what jewel was before it sold itself you know partially to altria right but you need a, a business that's aiming to try to take you know big tobacco's business away from it but you also need smart policy you need government taxation policies that tax vaping devices and things like that lower than cigarettes it makes no sense it would be like treating illegal street heroin the same as pharmaceutical heroin i mean it's a, a wildly crazy policy you know when and even when jewel made that deal with altria one of the good things about it was part of the deal would have meant displacing altria's cigarettes you know marlboros whatever they were with 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 vaping devices which were dramatically less dangerous. So what we need is innovative government policy incentivizing big tobacco and the other players as much as possible to move as rapidly as possible to get rid of the combustible forms of, of smoking, which are where the great harms are, are, are concentrated. There is a decent chance 
that the FDA will give a green light in coming months to selling some e-cigarettes legally, including possibly by Juul in the tobacco flavors. I mean, that, that may well happen based strictly on the scientific evidence, right? So I think we need to be ready to accept the fact that, look, part of what happened with the anti-cigarette movement is they split. One part of that world became a pro-harm reduction world right, who said, look, there's this technological breakthrough in the form of e-cigarettes and the heat not burn devices and the snusses, and we could dramatically reduce the harms of nicotine and tobacco in the world if people switch to it in this form. The other part of the anti-big tobacco world basically said the hell with harm reduction. And they said, we are now going to focus not on reducing the harms of tobacco in America and the world. We are going to focus, A, on trying to put a stake through the heart of big tobacco, and B, on becoming anti-nicotine ideologues, where any form of nicotine consumed in something other than the form of a patch or a gum is going to be foreboten by us. Now, that is not ultimately a public health or a harm reduction position. And paradoxically, the cigarette companies have been thriving. I mean, at this point, I look at Bloomberg in the same way that I look at the DEA as essentially being a kind of de facto ally to the narco traffickers, because the way they go about their business landed up in advantaging the most powerful and effective of the drug traffickers. I look at, you know, the campaign for tobacco free kids and, and the, 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 the Stan Glances, one of the professors UCSS who's been a leading opponent of vaping. I look at them as effectively doing the bidding of big tobacco while claiming to be their big their big opponents, because effectively they are retarding the decline in smoking. And where the big tobacco gets their biggest profits from is from cigarettes, not from vaping. And if vaping becomes the dominant thing and it becomes normalized, it's not just going to be big tobacco producing vaping devices because that's a technology. In the same way that the non-auto companies are now getting into, you know, producing cars and vehicles, right? So, I mean, it is an ass backwards policy on the part of the, to the quote unquote, you know, the anti-big tobacco thing. I 100% with them don't trust them as far as you can throw them, but incentivize it and use government incentives and public education so that we can reduce the smoking and the sales of combustibles as fast as possible. If in the end, a generation from now, we cut the number of smokers in America from 40 million down to five or 10, and we cut the number of smokers in the world from a billion a year down to a third or half of that. But at the same time, the number of people consuming nicotine in more benign forms is greater than the number of people smoking today. From a harm reduction perspective, it'll be a massive public health benefit that will be saving tens of millions of, of, of years of, of human lives. And that's, I don't see any evidence that can contradict what I just laid out to you there. Well, I would say, though, that the, uh, the, the decline and the cut in smoking prevalence all over here, at least in this country and places, was was occurring before vaping anyway. I mean, we've chopped it way down before this. So, I mean, there's just... Yeah, a lot of Steve, you're now in a real, you're in a group now, which is more firmly committed to smoking than ever before. You don't have the easy drop-offs anymore. Right. And that's, that's where the vaping begins to play a very, I mean, you have evidence emerging of something like 10, 7 to 10 million Americans who have actually quit smoking by vaping, and some of whom have then quit all nicotine entirely, right? And as I mentioned before, the drop in adolescent smoking that happened in recent years was unprecedented and almost impossible to explain without some of the kids who would have smoked becoming vapors instead. So yes, there were things working, but though that that had slowed those declines, uh, and the same thing's true globally. Same thing's true globally. There's still the number of people smoking in the world at a billion. It's a smaller percentage than the overall population, but it's that billion number is hanging right up there. So we need some major breakthroughs on this. So putting on and closing here, your your Nostradamus cap, um, or whomever <laughs> you prefer, um, you know, in in capsulizing, where do you think we're going with this in drug law? I mean, are you optimistic overall that things are improving on various fronts overall? I mean, a lot of this always depends on elections and things like that, but, you know, are you... You know, 
No. I am optimistic. I mean, look, I, 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 I am mostly, I think, the marijuana thing. I mean, we are heading towards full legalization. I do have my concerns about the mass commercialization. It's why I'm so happy about the New York model. And I get worried about people beginning to normalize marijuana where they stop even losing conscious of what it means to be high, you know, where it just becomes this thing. So, I, but those are minor concerns compared to the ultimate benefit, the great benefits of the victory. Psychedelics, you know, I mean, Michael Paul and I were talking when I interviewed him for the podcast a couple of days ago. You know, we, we, we both don't want to have, you know, we know there's going to be terrible things that happen when people use psychos, you know, ir, you know, dangerously the way it happened in the 60s. And hopefully there won't be a real flat pushback against that. I think Rick Dalvin's a little less worried about that, but I'm optimistic on the opioids. You know, I just we're just so slow on trying to do the right thing. COVID did accelerate making methanol buprenorphine more readily available to people, accelerated harm reduction. Biden administration is saying some of the right things and giving some harm reduction funding. So I think we're going somewhat the right way. I do worry that with these uh, substantial jumps in violent crime and homicides, that that tendency of the American public to get easily scared. Um, and even though overall crime has not been going up the way that homicides and shootings have been, sometimes that can play backwards on areas like drug policy. So we have to watch out for that sort of stuff. But I think generally we're going in the right direction. Around the rest of the world, harder to say. Uh, Latin America, you know, had some really bold leadership on uh, drug reform in uh, about seven, eight years ago. That's mostly faded. They are moving on marijuana reform, but not so fast and other stuff. Um, I'm, I'm happy that some, when you see this horrible, you know, rise of, of neo-fascism and Trumpism around the world in so many countries, um, and that's not just about us. That's about happening, you know, like what happened in the 20s and 30s around the world. I'm a little bit relieved that the right wing, those right wings have not jumped on the drug demonization the way they might have 10 or 20 years ago. But, it, you know, obviously the fate of the world is a bigger concern to all of us. And uh, But at least it's a relief to see that by bi bipartisanship has emerged in this country and to some extent others where the drug war is no longer a bipartisan thing, if anything, Drug reform is something of a bipartisan thing. I mean, two years ago, three years ago, when Congress couldn't pass almost anything bipartisan, two of the biggest bipartisan bills was one to get rid of drug-related mandatory minimum sentences, and the other was a pretty decent opioid uh, addiction bill. You know, both of those were bipartisan bills. Uh, so that really says something when you see bipartisanship breaking out. We've got a long way to go especially in dealing with overdose and with mass, undoing mass incarceration. But we definitely have the momentum and the wind at our backs right now. So. All right. Well, Ethan, it's been wonderful to talk with you and to hear from you with this, this update. I think we capsulated, covered a lot of ground in just this, you know, a little over an hour. So it's exactly what we wanted to do. So thank you very much for this. And uh, I will turn it now back over to Kira to sign us off. Okay. Thanks, Steve. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So, Steve and Ethan, thanks for the conversation, for offering your time here with us, and for everything you're doing in the world. Uh, again, we'll have the recordings produced of this conversation uh, and available on our website and our outlets. If you're on our mailing list or follow our feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, you'll be notified when the recordings are posted. Please make a donation if you haven't already. Uh, each donation is so important to us. And so I'll close. Steve Heilig and Ethan Nadelman, thank you for being with us at the New School at Commonweal. See you next time, everyone. <laughs>